All right, so we are ready to start the texturing process for the assets of our scene. So here we are inside Substance 3D Painter, and I have already imported the low-res FBX mesh that I exported from ZBrush with all my assets, and I have already baked all the maps that I need for the texturing process. This is a pretty straightforward process, and I covered the step-by-step -step process in my previous tutorial where I textured a stylized magic crystal. So feel free to check that video out if you want to see how I bake the textures inside Substance 3D Painter. For the textures, I'm going to start with the rocks, and I already have some stone materials in my library that I previously downloaded from the Substance 3D Asset Library, so I'm just going to go ahead and start dropping them into the mesh just to see how they look. I think the first material looks great for the big pebble, so we can go ahead and rename that and add a black mask, and then we can add a paint effect to the mask and use the polygon selection tool here on the left hand side with the UV mode to click and drag and select that big pebble. And this is a great tool because we already have UVs, so we can essentially select the UV islands that we want to restrict this mask to, and the material will be applied to that big rock. For the second material, we can go ahead and play with the rotation, the offset, and maybe the scale a little bit just to find a nice set of details from the texture itself that matches the rock that we're trying to create. And I think this one works best for the smaller rock on top, so I'll just use the same process to mask out the material and select the UVs for this rock. The next material would work great for the rock in the middle, and it has a slightly different hue, so I think it helps to create some contrast between the rock at the top and the one at the bottom. Let's go ahead and rename them and rearrange the layers so that they match the, the actual placement of the rocks. And let's add another slightly different rock material to the tiny pebble. We can always use the scale rotation and offset to really just find a better placement of the details of the texture. And now to integrate things a little bit better, I'll use that fifth extra material on top of the layer stack to add a black mask and drop a smart mask called the Dirt Ground. This helps to add a little bit of variation to the color based on the areas of the rock that are facing down towards the ground. And we can also variate the roughness and other properties of this material if we need to. Done, that's all we need for the rocks. Pretty straightforward process. Now for the creature, we can do something slightly more complex. We're gonna go ahead and start with a simple red color as the base for the skin and add a few more fill layers with a slight variation of hue. So something a bit brighter and more orange, another one on top that is more yellow, and finally another blue one just to add contrast. The next step is to go layer by layer and add a black mask, then add a fill effect to that mask and then add a procedural to the fill effect. The idea here is to generate some subtle variations in the color using procedural maps to drive the mask of the different layers. You can also change the blending mode of the different fill layers just to add additional depth to the color. It doesn't really matter that the skin looks a bit dirty right now. I actually want enough contrast because I'm planning to add a pretty strong subsurface effect to the material and that will wash out some of the color variation. For the top layer in blue, I use the ambient occlusion generator and I set the layer to soft light. That's it for the base. We can go ahead and put everything in a folder and call it base and add a few more details and variation to the rest of the creature. And you'll realize that as I add more complexity to this creature, the process is essentially the same thing, just targeting different channels and different areas of the creature. So to variate the roughness, for example, we can use a new fill layer, a black mask, a fill effect on that mask and drive that mask using the procedural texture. You can add another effect to further tweak the mask, like for instance, a blur effect, if you wanna soften the transition. And all we have to do is to turn all the channels off except the roughness. In exactly the same way, we can go ahead and add a few additional surface details using another layer, a procedural with a black mask, and this time adding some depth to the surface, tweaking the high slider channel. That's it, we can now tweak the rest of the channels for this layer, like the color and the roughness, just to refine how this specific effect blends with the rest of the base color. And if you want, we can go a little bit further in terms of the skin complexity for the creature with another layer. We'll repeat the same process from the previous skin layer, just to add some high frequency bumps with a different procedural texture. And that's pretty much it. To enhance the translucency of the skin, we can go ahead and fake it a little bit using a fill layer, adding a black mask, and then adding a fill effect. Pretty much what we've done so far, but instead of using a procedural texture this time, we're gonna bring in one of the baked mesh maps like the thickness map. I'm gonna set the color to a vibrant red and adjust the thickness map from the mask itself using some levels. This effect is obviously way too strong, so we can change the blending mode to something like overlay and then lower the opacity. The last layer for the skin will be a dark blue fill layer with a black mask and a paint effect so that I can manually target 
kind of like the dark spots around the hands and the bottom of the feet of the creature. And for this, I like to use the dirt brush. For other pieces of this character, like the eyes and the horns, the process is the same. I create a new black mask for the eyes and I use the UV field to select the UV islands that correspond to the eyes, just like I did with the rocks. For the horn, I use a smart material for a stylized bone and a couple of brown layers for the spine and the scales and the kind of like the claws of the character. And of course, I change the color of the horn to a light blue for a more complementary color to the orange of the skin. I'll skip the texturing of the leaf because it's exactly the same process, just using green colors and fill layers and of course different procedurals for the mask, but that's pretty much it. Now I need to create the base mesh for the actual ground of the scene. So I went back to ZBrush, I added a simple plane and adjusted the shape with the masking tools. The gizmo and the move brush in this case, nothing fancy here, but just to add a lot more complexity to the ground, I wanted to add some kind of vegetation leaves, almost like a moss material. So I decided to use the fiber mesh with textures, but let me show you something first. For the ground material, we can go to the Substance 3D Asset Library and search for grass. And you can go ahead and choose some atlas that you like. And when you click on the icon in the middle of the asset or in the middle of the thumbnail of the asset, you can send it directly to Substance Painter. And this is just in case you want to use it there or texture the models inside Substance Painter with the assets that you find here in the library. Instead, I just went ahead and downloaded the jungle grass floor material and I sent it to Substance 3D Sampler. Now, this is Substance 3D Sampler with the material in it and I just sent it from the library and I think it looks pretty good for a base material of the ground. Not that you'll see much of it, but it's good to have something to, to add complexity to the scene. So in 3D Sampler, we can quickly adjust a few sliders to totally customize the look of this parametric material. So I'm going to add some puddles just for fun. And if you click on the 2D viewer at the top right of the interface, you can actually see the maps that are making up this material. So after you have tweaked and customized your material, you can go ahead and click on the export button, choose an image format like PNG or JPEG and export all the maps. Now for the more fun part of this tutorial, we can go ahead and do the same thing in Sampler but with an atlas. So I'll just bring one of the ones I downloaded, like these grass stems. Now from the filters on 3D Sampler, we can search for Atlas Splitter Filter, and this is an awesome tool that will automatically recognize each separate bit of grass in this case, and basically split them up. We can enable the grid switch to see each bit of the grass in a grid form, and we have all the maps to recreate this material somewhere else. So I'm gonna turn off the grid view, and enable the auto crop so that more of the grass bit fills the texture area. And at this point, you can use the shape selection slider to cycle through the different bits of grass. So I'm going to go ahead and select something that I like and click on the export all maps into the image textures. And now in Photoshop, I can go ahead and bring the albedo and the alpha that I just exported to separate the color of the albedo from the background. We want to have a colored bit of grass on a black background. That's the aim here. And you can save this in a low resolution because this is purely a reference texture for ZBrush Fiber Mesh. All right, so now for the fun part, in ZBrush, we can go ahead and mask an area of the ground and we can enable the preview under the Fiber Mesh sub palette just to see some fibers. I already set this up, but I'll show you how it's done. Basically, we can click on the texture thumbnail and import any texture with a black background. That's the reason I wanted to have the albedo with a black background. Basically, what we save from Photoshop and Zbrush will recognize that black background as transparent if we go ahead and enable the transparency slider next to the texture slot. The cool thing is that you can change this texture to be anything that you want, and whatever fiber is created with fiber mesh will have that texture, it will have UVs. You can go ahead and select any texture that you want, go through the different settings and, you know, adjust the placement by changing the twist slider, the gravity slider, and all that sort of thing that um, will affect the behavior of the fiber mesh. The best thing here is just to play around with the settings because they will vary between projects. I went ahead and repeated this process for a few sets of the fiber mesh using different texture references from the Atlas material that we downloaded. So when you combine them all, it looks pretty interesting and very complex. So now that we have all the textured assets and additional materials to cover the ground, we are pretty much ready to move on into the rendering. You notice that I haven't set up the scene, but we're going to do that in Marmoset Toolback 4. I went ahead and re-exported the low-res mesh from ZBrush as an FBX, just to include the new fiber mesh and the plane for the ground, and then I dropped that FBX file here into the viewport. I have already chosen a nice environment image from the sky library here in Marmoset, and I have ray tracing enabled, so let's go ahead and set up some materials. The first thing I do is to create a new blank material and I'm just going to call it rocks. 
And I'm also gonna change the denoise from CPU to GPU so that we can take advantage of the graphics card. That way we can let the awesome NVIDIA RTX 3090 do its thing. And now even though we are using ray tracing, it feels like it's real time rendering. I'll bring the albedo map that I exported from Substance Painter into the albedo, the normal into the surface of the material and the roughness into the roughness. There are no metallic bits for the rock, so I'm just gonna leave the reflectivity slot empty. Exporting these texture sets from Substance 3D Painter is a very simple process, literally just one click operation, and I covered that during this stylized crystal tutorial, so feel free to check that out as well. All right, so let's go ahead and set up the material for the character now. And again, it's more of the same, the normal map into the normal, the albedo into the albedo, roughness into the roughness, and I have also exported an ambient occlusion, so I'll just enable it and add it there. You can always tweak this slider for the intensity as well. And now that we're here, we can also add the ambient occlusion to the rocks before I forget. And for a more realistic material of the skin, I'm just gonna add a volumetric scattering. But in order to see the effect a little bit better, we can now go ahead and add a single light source by selecting the sky and click on the light editor. I just rotate the light around a little bit just to try to position it coming from the back and kind of like from the left hand side of the character. And all right, now we can go ahead and select the skin and enable volumetric scattering. If the effect is too much or maybe too subtle, make sure that you check the scale of the scene because some properties of the material like this one will be affected by the scale. This creature is meant to be tiny, so I'll just set my scale to five from the scene tab and go back to the material to adjust the scale of the effect. All right, so let's go ahead and hide all the main assets for now and turn on the ground and the grass. We'll actually start with just the plane for the ground and create a material for it. This material is also pretty straightforward. Again, it's just a matter of plugging in the texture maps that we exported from 3D Sampler into the right slots of the material. And because the textures are tileable on this material, we can use the texture tiling slider from the texture section here at the top of the material settings to increase or if you want to decrease the scale of the material. I also ended up combining the albedo with a subtle beige color just to make the albedo uh, feel a little bit duller. All right, so now for the grass, let's go ahead and set up one first, and then I will skip the rest so that we can move a little bit faster. I'll just create a material and rename it so that it matches the name of the actual assets. And that's just to keep things organized. So now we can use the texture that we exported from 3D Sampler, drop it into the material, and it doesn't look like much at this point, but there are a couple of things that we need to do. The first thing is select the actual mesh, the actual fiber mesh that we exported from the scene tab. And under the mesh section at the bottom, make sure that you toggle off the callback faces tick box. This will allow us to see the back faces of the fiber mesh, which are essentially just a bunch of single-sided planes sharing the same UVs. The other thing that we need to do is enable transparency, and we can do that from this section here in the material, and bring in the black and white opacity map that we exported from Sampler. And in order to see the effect of the transparency, we just need to change the channel from A or alpha to anything else. So I'm just gonna choose the R or the red channel. Now we have a really complex scene with just a bunch of planes and textures. And keep in mind, this is just one of the five sets of fiber mesh that I set up. The only thing that you might notice is that the texture is actually upside down. So all we have to do is go to Photoshop and flip all the texture maps for each material. So to speed this process up, because I'm gonna have to flip all the different maps, I can just create an action in Photoshop by recording the process and then quickly repeat everything to the rest of the textures. Done. Now we can go back to Marmoset and everything will be updated and looking a lot nicer. All right, so now I went ahead and repeated this process five times for the rest of the fiber mesh objects. And this is how things look with all the fiber mesh objects and ground enabled. By the way, all of this time, everything looks really nice because I've been using ray tracing. It's just that the RTX 3090 makes it look like it's almost real time. One more thing you can do to enhance the look of set of materials is to add a bit of translucency to the plane. So I just use the volumetric scattered with a green color. Finally, the last asset that we need to set up is the leaf. I created a new material, plug in all the textures from the texture set that I exported from uh, 3D Painter, and then enable volumetric scattering with a green color, just to create the translucency effect of the leaf. Now it is time to complete the scene by placing the leaves and duplicating some of them to add more complexity. Now in recent versions of Marmoset Toolback 4, you can actually select the mesh and enable the edit point pivot so you can reposition it whatever you want. So I just did that for the leaves, placing the pivot right at the bottom of the leaves so that we can you know, easily manipulate them and place them as necessary or rotate them as we wanted to. The next step for me is to set up the camera and framing of the scene so that I know exactly what the camera in the final framing is going to see. So I created a new camera 
renamed it and set the save frame with full opacity. I like to start like this because like I mentioned, I, I like to know what the camera is actually going to render. The depth of field is something very important for the look and feel of this render. So I enabled that in the camera and I also selected the sticky focus. And this is a pretty cool feature that allows you to focus on specific areas. And as you rotate the camera, the focus will be maintained to that object. So in order to select the object or the area that you wanna focus, you can use the middle mouse button to click on that object and the camera is automatically going to focus on that point that you clicked. And that's it. We can now right click the leaf, duplicate it and use the move, scale and rotation to place this somewhere else or to place the duplicate somewhere else. I'm gonna speed up this process even more because I'm just moving and duplicating leaves and placing them around. Uh, there's, no, there's no technicality here, literally just taking one asset, duplicating it and trying to place it in a better way so that it helps to frame the camera and, and overall the composition. All right, so this is what I ended up with, and I brought in the, the sketch that I did at the beginning, just for your references, and I think this is pretty close to the original idea. I also like to play around with the camera effects, just to add a bit of blooming effect, maybe a vignette, and a little bit of grain as well. That's it, I rendered the image in a pretty high resolution with transparency, and I brought that into Photoshop. And because we have a transparent background, we can further enhance this render, just by trying out some different photos for the background. So I just loaded different options to see what looked good in the composition, and I decided to go with this one, which I think goes very well with the framing and, and the perspective of the camera. And at the end of this compositing process, I added some subtle color correction to the render and some tiny dust particles, and this is the final piece. And of course, now that we have the assets in 3D, it takes no time to do a few more renders just to make a couple more shots just for fun. That's it for this video. Hopefully this has been of help. And if you haven't, make sure that you subscribe to NVIDIA's YouTube channel for more updates.